Hi, this is Ms. Wright, and I am going to go over Great Expectations Stage 2 Notes for Chapters 20 through 30. Please use this information to help you with your presentations. The first passage that um, I want to discuss is at the very beginning of stage two where it says we Britons had at that time particularly settled that it was treasonable to doubt our having and our being the best of everything otherwise while I was scared by the immensity of London I think I might have had some faint doubts whether it was not rather ugly crooked narrow and dirty and in this passage Pip has arrived in London from Kent and I'm sure that he had an idea that London would be this beautiful shining city but when he gets there it's uh, like a lot of very crowded um, cities it's not very clean um, and he remarks on how dirty it is and uh, so there's a sense of disappointment that this is not exactly what he was hoping for or was expecting. And when it says, um, we Britons had at that time particularly settled that it was treasonable to doubt our having and our being the best of everything, it's very much like Americans today who believe America is the best country in the world and we're very, very proud of that. England, um, the people of England at that time also believed the same about their country and so when he gets to London and sees that it's not quite me measuring up to his um, vision uh, that he's disappointed so you can also think about the the theme of um, fantasy versus reality here the fantasy that was in his mind uh, definitely did not um, match the reality of London he goes to Mr. Jacker's office and at one point he's sitting around and he's in Mr. Jacker's um, uh, office waiting for him and it says Mr. Jacker's room was lighted by a skylight only and was a most dismal, dismal place. The skylight um, eccentrically patched like a broken head and the distorted adjoining houses looked as if they had twisted themselves to peep down at me through it. Okay, this little passage yields several things. Number one, we find out um, a sense of the atmosphere when he describes it as dismal. And also we get uh, a simile because we see like a broken head. And we have a simile there describing um, the skylight and we also have some personification at the end when it says the houses looking as if they had been twist had twisted themselves to peep down at me through it uh, would be an example of personification okay such as an old rusty pistol a sword in a scabbard, several strange looking boxes and packages, and two dreadful casts um, on a shelf of faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. This is a reference to those, um, all the different things in Mr. Jagger's office, but most particularly these two faces that are swollen. And they, what would happen is, after um, people had been hung, they would take them down and make a plaster cast of their face. So what Mr. Jaggers has there is um, the image of a dead person's face after immediately after he or she has been hung. And these casts are on the wall and it makes us definitely think about death and um, you would, I guess you can say it's a reminder for Mr. Jaggers that what he does is um, holds the life or death of a person and also people who come into his office. Uh, it would be a reminder of the seriousness of lying to Jaggers, of not cooperating with Jaggers, that they could be um, another one of these faces on the wall. The next 
quote is, Mr. Jagger's own high back chair was a um, deadly black horse hair with rows of brass nails in it, like a coffin. That's a simile. And I fancied I could see how he leaned back in it and a bit and bit his forefingers at the clients. So this um, tall high back chair uh, that's all black with these nail heads surrounding it is very reminiscent of a coffin. And here again we have the death imagery, the association with death and Mr. Jaggers. This is an illustration from the David Lean film, which is the film I recommend. And it says, this quote says, whereas I now found Barnard to be a disembodied spirit or a fiction and his in the dingiest collection of shabby buildings ever squeezed together in a rank corner as a club for tomcats. And tomcats are just wild cats that roam around. Um, and this is Pip describing his lodgings, where he will be staying. So this is another disappointment, having arrived in London. He's not staying in the loveliest of places. He's staying in a rather humble, low-rent kind of hotel. By the end of chapter 21, he says, Lord, bless me, you're the prowling boy. And... Um, Herbert says, Lord bless me, you're the prowling boy. Pip says, and you, said I, are the pale young gentleman. And this is the cliffhanger at the end of the chapter. And we realize that Pip and Herbert, Herbert have met before. They met and fought in the back of Mrs. Havisham's house when they were much younger. And Pip would go there to entertain Miss Havisham. The pale young gentleman and I stood contemplating one another in Barnard's Inn until we both burst out laughing. The idea of its being you, said um, said he. So these young men, they recognize each other and they are going to have a friendship which will last the rest of the novel. It's one of the few um, positive aspects of Pip's life is his her uh, friendship with Herbert. At one point, um, Pip asks um, Herbert to help him uh, learn to be uh, a gentleman by showing him manners, how to speak properly, and um, how to eat uh, correctly with his knife and fork. And while they're having dinner one night, Herbert reveals secrets about Mrs. Havisham's past. That's chapter 22. And by chapter 23, Herbert Pocket took me to the house and showed me my rooms. The house that they're going to is his father's house, um, Matthew Pocket, because Matthew will be Herbert's tutor. And um, it's in Hammersmith. Hammersmith is another setting in stage two, which was a pleasant one and so furnished as that I could use it with my comfort for my own private sitting room. He then knocked at the doors of two other similar rooms and introduced me to their occupants by name Drummle and Startop. And Drummle will be an antagonist for Pip throughout stage two. Startop will become a, one of Pip's good friends. Drummle, an old looking young man, <clears throat> of a heavy order of architecture, which means he was a heavy set guy, was uh, whistling. Startop, younger in years and appearance, was reading and holding his head. Uh, you notice the alliteration, H, 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 as if he thought himself in danger of exploding it with too strong a charge of knowledge. So these are the two young men who are also being tutored along with Pip by Mr. Pocket, Herbert's father. Um, also in chapter 22, we have Matthew Pocket 
says by degrees I learnt and chiefly from Herbert that Mr. Pocket had been educated at Harrow and at Cambridge where he, he had distinguished himself but that when he had had the happiness that's more alliteration he had had happiness of marrying Mrs. Pocket very early in life he had impaired his prospects and taken up the calling of a grinder grinder here means a teacher or a tutor after grinding a number of dull blades dull blades is a metaphor for uh, students and not very bright students of whom it was remarkable that their fathers when influential were always going to help him to preferment meaning to um, improve in life but always forgot to do it when the blades had been had left the grindstone so when uh, Mr. Pocket finished tutoring these young men their fathers who had made promises never kept the promises and the grindstone is just the school or wherever he would tutor them he had wearied of that poor work and had come to London here after gradually um, failing in loftier hopes he had read with divers um, divers meaning various students who had lacked the opportunities or neglected them and had refurbished divers others for special occasions and had turned his acquirements to the account of literary compilation and correction and what all this is saying that when he went to London he once again started tutoring um, and then also when it talks about literary compilation and correction he began writing or editing works by other people and on such means added to some very moderate private resources meaning small amounts of money still maintain the house I saw and that income from editing writing um, tutoring plus the little money that he had is how he kept his house Wemmick's home is his castle and this is one of the most delightful parts of stage two is Wemmick's home he has made it to look like a miniaturized castle a tiny little thing it appeared to be a collection of um, back lanes ditches and little gardens and to present the aspect of a rather dull retirement Wemmick's house was a little wooden cottage in the midst of plots of gardens and the top of it was cut out and painted like a battery mounted with guns um, so he has this home that he's made to look like a little um, castle and he also if you remember has a little cannon that he fires at nine o'clock each night um, and he's very proud of this and his aged parent his deaf father is also very proud uh, my own doing said Wemmick looks pretty don't it I highly commended it I think it was the smallest house I ever saw with the queerest gothic windows by far the greater part of them sham meaning fake and a gothic door almost too small to get in at so he's made this tiny miniature castle Wemmick's home is his castle that's a real flagstaff you see said Wemmick um, so he's done everything to make it as authentic as he can the bridge was a plank and it crossed a chasm about four feet wide and two feet deep now the word chasm means a deep crack in the earth but it's being um, ironic here or hyperbolic here because the the crossing is only four feet wide and only two feet deep you could never drown in it but um, the author is playing with language here it's supposed to add humor but it was very but it was very pleasant to see the pride which would with which he hoisted it up because he's made a little drawbridge to cross the four foot moat and made it fast um, smiling as he did so with a relish meaning an enjoyment and not merely mechanically okay that's all I can do in this part I'm going to continue um, my PowerPoint in a next uh, presentation thank you